We all know it takes creativity to write stories and create art. Music takes creativity, fashion, theater. But when it comes to science, many people think it's just math, microscopes, and molecules. But actually, an essential tool for doing science, one that is constantly used, is creativity. Scientists are trying to understand a complex world full of causes and effects, different patterns across different scales, and we're trying to make predictions. And ultimately, that requires ideas. Creativity is how we come up with those ideas. It's essential to how science is done. I'm not a very good painter, and I can't draw. I can't make a sculpture, but I can think very creatively. I can think about a problem in a lot of different ways. And that's what we're taught to do. That's what scientists are taught to do. And that's why scientists are valuable in society, because we are trained to think that way. Thanks, everybody, for coming. What I want to do is share my screen. Kay Beidel and Kim Tumatricone are leading a diverse team of scientists working on a type of project called GCR. It's not really important what that stands for. Okay, that's what it stands for. But what is important is that these scientists are working together in a way that illustrates why science can't be done without creativity. But before we get into the specifics, we have to look at the process of science itself. On the most basic level, the process of science is cyclical. You observe something in nature which raises a question, how does this work? You form a hypothesis. You run an experiment to test this hypothesis. And based on the results, you form a new hypothesis. And then at some point, you might use all of your experimental data to build a model. A model is sort of like a virtual experiment, which allows you to test your hypothesis in a simulated, more complex environment. And just like a physical experiment, the results of running a model lead to new observations requiring new interpretation and which can lead to new hypotheses. When you see scientists working, they're at some point in this cyclical process, coming up with questions they have about the natural world and looking for answers. There's probably many answers and there's many different ways to get to that answer. And one of the things we have to do as scientists is be creative and think in different ways. Thinking in different ways actually starts here, observing patterns in nature, interpreting them, and making educated guesses about what's happening. This is called forming a hypothesis. And this hypothesis doesn't exist yet. It needs to be thought up. So scientists aren't generating hypotheses in the scientific method um, from a list of things that are already written up. Um, science always moves forward. At, at the same time, we're not grasping at things out of thin air. A hypothesis comes from interpreting data. You look at what you've collected, and then based on what you already know, come up with a new idea that explains what you're seeing. Often this involves many ideas that are connected together, and that's because natural processes are complex and have many moving parts that are connected together. A good example of this is the carbon cycle. Carbon is in all living things. It's in the air, it's in the oceans. One of the ways carbon moves around is by organisms like plants or phytoplankton sucking up CO2 from the air and using the carbon to make plant or phytoplankton parts. Then animals eat those plants and they breathe out and some of that carbon goes right back into the air. Or dead organisms settle on the ocean floor and then get crushed or compressed, turning into oil or becoming part of the rock. And when this happens, the carbon is locked up and it can stay like that for thousands of years. One great example of this is marine snow. Particles of dead organisms that constantly fall to the ocean floor like snow that eventually get compressed into rock. But here's the complex part that Kay and Kim and the GCR group have been looking at. If these particles of dead organisms, instead of sinking to the ocean floor, stay at the surface, they can get eaten by other animals. Those animals breathe out, and then some of that carbon goes right back into the atmosphere. The GCR team wants to know what makes these particles sink or float because knowing that determines where the carbon goes. Does it go back into the air or does it get locked up at the bottom of the ocean? This is a key piece of the carbon cycle and it's really difficult to study because the ocean is huge and the particles are microscopic. So if you're here trying to test hypotheses, you've got a big problem to solve. So one of the big challenges that we have as oceanographers is to bring the ocean, the biggest prominent feature on Earth, into the lab. 
And here too is where creativity is essential. Because oftentimes conducting experiments means building something that doesn't exist yet. Like this tube that mimics the physics of the ocean. It makes particles clump together. Or this big tank that simulates ocean turbulence. How you approach the problem and how you try to solve it is creative in and of itself. You know, literally creating that um, set of experimental conditions that'll let you solve that problem. You have to spend months in the lab trying it out. When running experiments, scientists are constantly trying to solve the problem of how do we set up an experiment to test this thing I want to test? And often, you're missing the tools you need. So to a certain extent, this process of creativity is also just accepting what has been missing because we often want to make progress, but we don't want to say what has been missing in our work. In this case, what was missing was a way to take tiny particles from a giant ocean and bring them into the lab so you can actually watch them individually sink and measure their different properties. The ecosystem, like the ocean, is very large. And many of the phenomena, for example, the phenomena that we're interested in uh, is marine snow, will travel from the surface of the ocean all the way to the bottom of the ocean, you know, four kilometers or so. But the phenomena at its heart has a microscopic player, which is a single cell, which can be from 10 to 100 microns. So how do you watch a microscopic particle sink thousands of feet in a lab that's only 10 feet tall? That's one way that we as scientists have to be creative in bridging those, that 12 order of magnitude scale. And what we decided to do is build the world's tallest microscope by a trick. What Manu's team actually did was create a water treadmill where particles can fall forever. Basically, it's two plastic donut-shaped disks sandwiched together, leaving a little enclosed gap. And then that gap gets filled with seawater full of marine snow. Now, this wheel of water is then mounted on a motor attached to a microscope. A computer with special software spins the wheel at exactly the right speed so that the microscope stays focused on a single particle as it falls in real time. Which allows us to now observe a particle that's sinking literally over infinite distances. By thinking creatively, Manu and his team were able to invent and build a new piece of equipment that allows them to make observations and measurements that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. And these observations lead to new hypotheses, which will lead to new experiments and new data and new interpretations of how particles form, how they sink, and the biological, chemical, and physical processes that create and impact them. And this continues the cycle of the scientific method. And then the next step is taking all this information gathered in the lab and trying to scale it up to understand how particles sink in the much bigger and more complex ocean. And the way the team is doing this is by creating computer models. The way you do it, right, is you start simple and you build up from there, build things up additively, right? We can represent different processes one by one, and then you say, okay, we, we understand, you know, this process, let's add it to that process. You're merging sort of bedrock principles with sort of new ideas. Basically, Dan and the other mathematical modelers sit in front of their computers, turning biological, chemical, and physical processes into lines of code. Some of that code has already been thought up, like code that describes sinking speeds or turbulent flow. And others are new that have to be created based on this new experimental data. And then they run the program and see if the results make sense. Does the end result produce results that are sensible or do we get results that are nonsensical, like mass just magically appears, right? And so th your job then is to solve that problem. What the hope would be is that you kind of get, okay, consistency between the virtual world evolution and processes and the real world evolution and processes. And so that forms our basis, our theory, our hypothesis for what is going on there. So to interpret your data and understand what it's telling you about the system you're investigating, you need ideas. You need ideas to come up with hypotheses. You need ideas to design the experiments to test these hypotheses. And you need ideas to build the equipment to run your experiments. You need ideas on how it all fits together, how to create new computer simulations. You need ideas to predict how systems work. And generating ideas requires creativity. Yeah, that's why we have PhDs, right? A PhD is a doctor of philosophy, because we're supposed to be philosophizers. And 
What do philosophers do is they think about a problem from many different angles. But there's another critical aspect of creativity that is inherent and underlies this research team and their research on particles. In my experience, scientists are inherently creative, but we're often limited within our own discipline as to what is possible. When we bring scientists from diverse disciplines together in the beginning and incubate and develop ideas and hypotheses about how things work, it catalyzes creativity. Getting people to be creative together from different disciplines, biology, chemistry, physics, math, engineering, modeling, is how really complex science questions get answered. Understanding processes like the carbon cycle in a changing climate is vital to solving future problems. That's why it's important to train scientists early to think creatively together. In my class, I teach students how to think beyond their own field. I teach them to appreciate that even though you've been trained in something very specifically, there's often a much bigger perspective out there. And there's probably a lot of different perspectives. And just being open to that, being open to, to learning, being open to understanding the way someone else might see something or think about something or come up with a solution to a problem is itself a skill that as a scientist or a future policymaker or a future educator, um, we all need to learn that skill to tackle the big problems that we have um, in the future. We are all better together. And when we put our knowledge and our skills and our data and our perspectives together, I am confident we will tackle the problems in a better way than we would have if we did it alone. So in their quest to figure out how phytoplankton plays a role in the global carbon cycle, Kay, Kim, and their colleagues rely on combined creativity to study a system as complex as the ocean. They need biologists to figure out what makes these organisms grow and die, chemists to figure out if the particles are heavy enough to sink, physicists to figure out how the water moves, engineers to figure out how to actually measure these things, and mathematical modelers to put it all together. Creativity might seem like an artistic skill not related to science, but it really just means having a flexible mind and finding new ways to solve new problems. If you like the tools of science, please subscribe. And if you want to learn about more tools, click next video.